Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. We'll be continuing today in the study that we started last week, talking about blessed are the poor, poor in spirit. Uh, but it may be a little bit different than you're anticipating, if indeed you're anticipating something. And I pray that you are, that you come ready for, for something, ready for the word. Uh, but before we get into it, I just want to ask, Father, Lord, that you would guide everything that I speak, that you would guard my mouth, Lord God, that you would set a guard over my mouth, that I wouldn't say anything, I wouldn't let anything come forth that you've not put into my heart, Lord God, that what I say would be pleasing to you, Lord God, and a blessing to all of us. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you can still use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise, because here I am. So I ask you to bless this time in your word, Lord. Amen. All right. As I said, we started last week, we talked about blessed are the poor in spirit. And I had mentioned something, but I, I want to pick up on that and kind of expound and expand on one of the things I said last week. And that's about repentance. All right. I want to read, first of all, from Matthew 4, 17. This is when Jesus had been tempted in the wilderness. And after he came out of the wilderness, it says when he heard, and I'm reading verse 12, when Jesus heard that John, talking about John the Baptist, had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulon and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea, by the, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the great light. The great light is about us being able to see the truth. Jesus is the light of the world who came into the world. He is the one who proclaimed that he is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. When I say repent, I think far too many Christians don't have a good understanding of that word. You know, Mark and Alice are here with me, and uh, Alice and I just returned from a few days on the road traveling down south to, to Miami and West Palm Beach to visit with some Christian schools and a seminary. And just before we left, we did, on a Sunday after services, what we do quite frequently, go out together for lunch. But because Alice and I were getting ready to travel, I said, uh, I changed my mind about going to where we normally went and said, can we go someplace else? It would be a little faster and so I changed my mind about that. Is that repentance? Well, I think it's, a lot of people would say, the word repent means to change your mind. And I don't think that's quite accurate, all right? If I went to, to, if I went to this store and I said, or I went to McDonald's and I went there to have a hamburger, but when I got there, I changed my mind and had chicken McNuggets. Is that repentance? No. Repentance is not just changing your mind about a thing temporarily. Repentance literally means to change the way you think. Because when you change the way you think, it will change the way you behave. It changes everything. And that's why Paul said in Romans 12 that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Because God is changing our mind. He's changing the way we think. And nowhere is that more clear than in the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount, as I have said so many, many times over the years, is the single most important teaching in the history of mankind. What Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount is far, far more important than any worldly philosopher ever said. It's far more important than anything that Einstein ever said. It's far more important than any politician has ever said. Because this is life-changing to eternal life. Okay, I know Einstein did a lot, but if you get hit on the head with a nuclear bomb, you'll go fizz someplace, but if you haven't bought into what Jesus said, you're going to go to the wrong place. Okay, so it's, it's really important that 
Changing your mind can be temporary. Saying you don't want to do something anymore. They're called New Year's resolutions. And how well do New Year's resolutions generally work out? They don't. Because you've changed your mind about something you're doing, but you haven't changed the way that you think. Okay? I, you, you need to think about that. You need to meditate on it. You need to pray about that. Because I don't think there's a more important statement. That's why the word repentance is so important in Scripture. John the Baptist came and he preached repentance. Now, you think he was just saying, come say you're sorry? He was not. He, something, something is about to happen. You have to change the way you think. What was the way they thought? What was, what was the thinking that Jesus came and it was so important for us to change? It was about salvation. It was about a right relationship with God the Father. Jesus came into the world to offer himself a sacrifice, right? And that was his mindset. Philippians chapter 2 says, have the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus. And he, he go, go read it. Starting at verse 5, Philippians chapter 2. You got to play. You got to participate in this, okay? So what happens is that where all of a sudden, I mean, for years, for centuries, people had come to believe that a right relationship with God was based on the works that you did, on the animal sacrifice, on keeping these days and that day and that, which was not the case. And there, was, there were people that had insight into that. I mean, even David, who is the most famous king of Israel prior to the coming of Jesus Christ, he is the seed of, of Jesus Christ. He's the root and the offspring was Jesse, his father, right? But he had to change his mind. And he said, no, it's not about the sacrifices. He said, a broken and contrite heart, those are the acceptable sacrifices to God. It's not, it's not about the, the law. It's not about keeping the law. When God has changed you, then you're able to do that. Before that, you're not able to. And that, the scriptures are clear on that. You're not able to keep the law. Okay? So, over and over and over in the Sermon on the Mount, there is a pattern that we need to understand. And this is why the Sermon on the Mount is so terribly, terribly important. And I, I've said this before. If you haven't read it lately, go read it again. And let me make one more suggestion. If you have read it recently, go read it again. Okay? It is, it is incredibly important. There are so many Christians today who think that Jesus Christ came to change the law. He did not. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, 17, he said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. It's about the way you think about the law. Okay, because all of a sudden, when you have a right understanding, everything changes. How many times did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? You have heard it said that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commit murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Well, wait a minute. People, I hear Christians say all the time, you know, the law was hard. That law was hard. Thank God we're not under the law. You know what? Which was harder? What Jesus taught? Or what the law taught? He's saying, I mean, where did they hear? The ancients were told, you shall not. That's the law. But he's saying, he's saying it's even more than that. People ask me a lot about tithing. Do I believe in tithing? Well, I believe in being a giver because it says it's more blessed to give than to receive. But the fact is you don't earn points by it. What do you, what do you have to give that God didn't give you? And the tithing, the law of tithing, as it's most understood in the church, is God wants you to give 10% of what you have. Now, that's the law. That's hard. So now Jesus has come, and you know what Jesus says? You've got to give it all. You've got to give it all. Forget the 10% part. 
And that's why the blessed are the poor in spirit is so important that we talked about last week. Because nothing that you have belongs to you. You have been entrusted with things. You have not been given things. We talked about it last week. If you didn't see that, please go back and review it. Ownership, stewardship, and possession. Everything belongs to God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and all that it contains, and those who dwell in it. You don't belong to you. You were purchased with a price. You belong to God. He has given us stewardship of what belongs to him. In many cases, he's given us possession of things that belong to him, that we're entrusted with, and entrusted with we are responsible for. We need to start thinking differently than we did. We need to learn to think differently. So we're talking about repentance. Repentance means to change your mind. But it means that what it really means is to change the way you think. And it's very, very unfortunate that since in the early days of the church, when I say early days of the church, I'm talking about biblical times. I'm talking about post, right after the biblical times, that somehow the, the, the church in Rome got involved, or what was becoming evolving into the church of Rome. And repentance was translated in the, in the Vulgate into Latin as penitence. In other words, being sorry for something. It's not about being, I mean, you know, if you change your mind, you may have remorse over something that you were doing, some lifestyle you were doing, but that's not what it's about. What it's about is coming to a new understanding and thinking in new ways. What ways? With the mind of Christ. We have been given the mind of Christ. We've been given a sound mind. But if we're still under the law, thinking in the old ways, we will not be operating in the blessings of God. That's a fact. He said again, you know, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, that's a good thing. You shouldn't commit adultery. But Jesus said, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Is that easier? No, because you know why? Because now the Holy Spirit lives within you. You now have the power to live righteously. Okay, I'm, I could go through this. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of deserve. But I say to you, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows. But I say to you, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not even resist. I do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from who, him who wants to borrow from you. This is the new way of thinking. We have to learn to retrain our thinking. You know, what, how, do you, what, how do you come to what, believing what you believe now, thinking what you think now? Let me ask you a question. And I'm not being facetious. This is a serious question. When you were born, did you know that 2 plus 2 equal 4? No, you didn't. Even if you were a prodigy and a math genius, when you were born, you didn't know it. So how did you come to know it? Somebody taught you. And you bought what you were taught. How did these, how did these Jews come to all of these beliefs? They were taught. How were they taught? Were they taught by the word? More often than not, they were not. They were taught by commentaries, what somebody thought about the word. They were taught by the Pharisees. Right? But how often in the Sermon on the Mount does Jesus talk about the Pharisees and say they're hypocrites? You know, if they say something that aligns with the word, pay attention to it. But don't be like them. You, everything you believe, you believe, everything you, because you accepted something that was taught to you. Don't, don't be so filled with pride that you think that it all just came to you, whoosh, you know, and it didn't come from someplace. What do you have, the Bible says, what do you have that you didn't receive? Everything you have, you received from someplace. You know, I used to pre pre uh, preach one particular sermon that had, called the attitude of the righteous. And I preached that 
all over the United States. I've preached it all over the UK. I've preached it in Europe. I've preached it in, in Africa. And the response has always been phenomenal to that, because I, not because of me, but because it's a message that really is powerful. And I, I don't think I ever taught that message or preached that sermon that somebody, usually a pastor, would come up to me and say, do you mind if I preach that? Do you mind if I use that? And then I kind of say, well, are you, are you kidding? I, I, I didn't come up with this on my own. I plagiarized it. I plagiarized it from the Apostle Paul. Because everything in that sermon comes from the Apostle Paul and his letter to the Philippians. You don't have to be ashamed of that. You're not under any obligation to be original. Because God has provided everything that we need. God, the Lord, has given us whatever we need. Anything that we have. Don't, if any man boasts, let him boast in the Lord. So if you think you came up with these thoughts, repent. Change your mind. Change the way you think about it. Give glory to God because God is the author of all good things. All right? I want to I want to say this again. I'm going to keep saying it. Repentance is about changing the way that you think. And Jesus was so insistent on that because when you change the way you think, you will change the way you live. You will change the way you act. That's the way it works. Okay? And if it's working properly, it starts with what you believe in your heart. For faith is what comes in your heart. With the heart, man believes. And then with the mouth, he confesses. That's where you got to start doing. You have to be willing to confess what you believe. But above that, because the answer is always free, you have to believe it, you have to confess it, and then you got to walk it. you got to live it, which is one of the things that the Pharisees didn't do, which is why they were hypocrites. They, they preach one thing and do another. How did you learn to pray? How did, how did the Jews at the time learn to pray? From the Pharisees. I mean, these were the teachers. These were the teachers of the word. These were the teachers of what their faith was supposed to be. You know, it says in the New Testament to us, we do not know how to pray as we should. So how do you know how to pray? By letting the Holy Spirit within you pray. By praying through the word of God. By praying the will of God. Because that's what John says in his first letter. If we ask anything in his, according to his will, we know, we have confidence that he hears us. So it comes again, not from you expressing your desire, but from you knowing God's desire. That makes prayers easy to be answered. Because he said in Matthew 6, 5, when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Well, praise God. You have to be taught how to pray. Now, I was raised a Catholic, went to Catholic school. And I'll tell you one of the problems. I mean, I was taught how to pray. And how to, how to pray? Well, my, my prayer life was, you know, put your hands together, bow your head, and pray to whom? To the saints? To Mary? Pray the Hail Mary 50 times? But Jesus says, because he's teaching us how to pray. He says, avoid vain repetition. God doesn't hear you for your many words. Well, what he's doing is telling us to change the way we think. We need to understand that we have a teacher, a master, and we are to learn from him. We're to go to him and learn from him anything, anything that you do has to come out of your transformed, your renewed mind. You know, the, people, the Jews of Jesus' time, they learned, they knew what they knew from the Pharisees. But I made a note for myself, Jeremiah, because we're studying Jeremiah in another study. 
In Lamentations 2.14, he said, Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your iniquities so that you might be restored. How, how, how did you learn how to pray? How did you learn? How do you learn what's pleasing to God? Well, I'm going to tell you, most of the times what the church says is pleasing to God is pleasing to the church more than it's pleasing to God. You have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You must repent. But that doesn't mean running someplace and saying, I'm sorry. It doesn't mean running into a confessional box and telling a priest you did something wrong. It means that you need to understand in your own life that you need to change the way that you think. It's that simple. It really is simple. Oh, except for the fact that your flesh will fight that tooth and nail because your flesh is perfectly happy with you just the way you are. Or maybe it'd like to bring you down a little bit. God loves you just as you are. Our Father loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to go to the cross in your place. That's how much he loves you. He loves you that much, and his love is unconditional. But you know what? His promises aren't unconditional. His promises are conditional upon you receiving and believing them and acting upon them. We were studying last week, blessed are the poor in spirit. And I said that there's a reason because God is a God of good order. Why did he pick that to be the very first thing he taught in this important sermon? Because you have been taught all of your life that the single most important thing in your life is money. That every key to happiness, every key to a successful life is all about money. But Jesus, that's what the entire sixth chapter, basically, of, of the Sermon on the Mount is about. about. When Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Well, so he, then he goes on to say, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? That's a reasonable question. But this is a question. I'm telling you, we've, not, we've gotten out of the habit of reading Scripture and seeing Jesus ask a question and bothering to answer it. Are you worried about things in your life? Why? Because if you, if you have worries in your life, it is simply, there's one simple reason for it. You don't believe and trust in the love of God. This is what Paul taught because Paul had been totally changed by that understanding. If the Father loved us so much that he gave his only begotten Son on the cross, what good thing would he withhold? And this entire thing is be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. How much time, I'll tell you what, how much money is spent on what you're going to wear? I mean, the fashion industry, I think they spend about trillions and trillions of dollars on advertising to get you focused on what you're going to wear. Our, 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 the Western world is consumed by these things. And Jesus said, don't worry about them at all. Put them out of your mind. He'll take care of all these things. If you change the way you think. So I just want to bring you back to one point. Yeah, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, if you don't go spend time with the Lord, talking to him, thinking about, praying about the things that I'm saying, I'm wasting my time. But think about this. Jesus Christ said, the word made flesh, proclaim, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all the rest shall be added unto you. The world is seeking all the stuff, the worldly stuff. And the unfortunate part is more and more and more I see in the church, they're seeking the worldly stuff. And they think that'll please God. It doesn't please God. When you trust, let me tell you this. When you trust God, it involves risk to the flesh. Is there any place in the scripture where that says it's not true? 
Because Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? So don't fear those who can kill the body. We, we have a focus that is wrong because our thinking is wrong. And I'm here today to say you need to repent. That doesn't mean to rush off and tell somebody you're sorry. It just means to say, that, look, show me how to change the way I think. He has given you the mind of Christ. He has given you instruction. That's what this Bible is on how to think. And by the way, that's from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. The entire thing, because the just simply because it wasn't well understood in Old Testament times, believe me, it's not understood in New Testament times either, doesn't mean that it's not the Word of God that tells you what life is supposed to look like. You have to be willing to place yourselves totally, completely in the hands of God and know that you'll be safe. Because you want to know something? That's the only place you'll be safe, is in the palm of His hand, in the shelter of the Most High, in the shadow of the Almighty, there is no safety outside of that. Be anxious for nothing. That is not an encouragement. That's not a suggestion. That is a command of God. If you're being anxious, go get before the Lord and say, Lord, help me, help me. He will change your mind because that's his desire. His desire is not to punish you. His desire is to bless you and cause you to grow into the fullness of the knowledge of him. We're going to look at more in the Sermon on the Mount as we go along the weeks. As I said, I don't believe that there is anything more important. Everything that was before the Sermon on the Mount is kind of like a foreshadowing leading up to it. Everything after it is a commentary on it. You show me anything in the letters of Paul that can't be brought back to the Sermon on the Mount, and you'll shock me. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Change the way you think. Don't put your trust in man. Don't put your trust in money. Put your trust in God. Put your ambition in the hand of God. Man's ambition is an enemy to the spirit. Pride is insidious and pride is a killer. Humble yourself in the sight of God. Say, Lord, I'm unable. Tell me what to do. Humble yourself and he will exalt you. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You have been taught all of your life. Since the day you were born, everything around you, at least in the Western world, has taught you that money is the answer to all things. That is the biggest lie. Money, love doesn't, it's ridiculous. Money is not the answer to anything. Jesus is the answer to everything. He'll provide what you need. He'll provide the money if you need it. But he may just provide the thing that you think you need the money for. Help us to learn how to repent, Lord God. Help us to joyfully repent. Help us, Lord God, to come before you and say, I trust you, Lord. Show me how to live that life where I am totally, completely, and absolutely dependent on you and on your love. And that I will place myself in the, in the palm of your hand, Lord God, where no man can snatch us out. Lord, I want to be like you. I want to think like you. I want to act like you. And above all, I want to love like you. And I thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus, who brought us this new knowledge, who brought us this light into the Word, that we would know how to live. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name, Father. Amen and amen. God bless you until next time. Bye bye. Thank Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. Yeah.